come with me to the pulpit our senior pastor pastor Moravi Wanjao thank you so much pastor Tosh how are you doing Mavuno it's great to be here this morning and wow what an amazing what an amazing memorable time we're creating memories uh, one day when our children come to worship and they find an amazing place we'll be able to say we were there uh, when all this history began to take place and we're so excited Johan uh, that you and your family are here we're so excited we've been longing to have you visit our services I remember when we first met Johan I talked to a few architects in our congregation and I said we're getting the uh, pretty much top one of the top two African firms to design this building and and they said, why don't you just get Kenyans to do it? Uh, we can do this. We have what it takes. And I invited them to the first meeting when we met with Johan. And they were there when he came and brought his designs to us. And one of them, one, a very senior architect, he walked up to me in this congregation, walked up to me and he said, now I know why we had to have this man come. And he said, we are going to learn so much as we work with him as the architects in Mavuno Church. And so we're really grateful to you for the experience you'll be able to share with us and to even help us to grow as we do this. Amen, Mavuno? Because this is our year two to occupy. And I'll just say in passing, uh, our building, uh, that what we're trying to put up on that place, uh, that our desire is it will also be a place of occupation uh, for us. Uh, spiritually, it's going to give us a place to occupy because right now, uh, Johan was sharing with us that in their church, when they were doing the, the construction, uh, the church was so full that people, when the pastor would be saying the blessing, people would be trying to sneak out to run to their cars so they don't get caught in traffic jam. Of course, we don't do that here, Johan. We're very different in this church. Uh, but you know, you know, many of us have relatives who would never come to church because of the traffic jam getting out of the church and we believe it's going to be an opportunity for us to be able to bring people to church who would never come to church uh, because we have the access you are talking about uh, uh, family wise it's going to help us occupy relationally as well because we know we want to put up a counseling center there we're going to have places where families can recreate and one of the things I'm really looking forward to is church where you can bring your kids and after church you can hang out with your life group and there's playgrounds and there's a swimming pool and there's places where kids can hang out and when you go home it's just time to wash actually you don't even wash them. They shower there and they just go to bed. Amen? I mean, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about occupying in our families as well. It's also going to be a place where we can occupy physically because we're saying we want to have a fully equipped gym there. Amen? So, Pastor Diane, just preach about gym. You also go and gym in the church. Is that okay? We'll be keeping you accountable as life groups. Uh, but you know what? We want to have a, a, a running track. We want to have sports facilities because how many know that this city is developing like a concrete jungle? with very little opportunity for the community to have space to recreate. And we're saying that this space, we want to create a space that would be a blessing, not for the church only, but for the whole community around us. And also, it's going to be a place where we can occupy financially. One of the things that we've talked about is we want to have retail opportunities there, not because we want to become a business, but because we want to incubate the businesses of people in this church and to set up some huge multinationals that will start right here. Tell, the, tell somebody the pastor could be talking about you right now. Uh, so this is, <laughs> this, is part of what, this is part of what we're going to talk about. And also in addition to that, I've actually challenged the development team led by Pastor Moniki here. I've said to them, you know what? This should be the year when Mavunites begin to own their own land and their own houses. And one of the things I've challenged them is as soon as we've settled there, that they need to come up with a development company. They need to find us a good piece of land. And we, are, we actually need to buy into that piece of land as a church. And that every single person here will have a house uh, that they own. Whether it's an investment property or it's your first house, that we as a church can actually enable each other to own homes. Can't we do that together, Mavuno? To God be the glory. We can do this. This is our year to occupy. And you know what? Uh, one of the things I want to tell you is don't just clap. Get ready. You need a deposit to own a house. Houses are not just given by faith because you prayed. So tell your neighbor, get ready. <laughs> Occupy financially. We need to be doing that this year. And so this is why I'm so excited about this. This is not just a building. Uh, this is a place that helps us begin to be who God is calling us to be. I want to continue with our series. Uh, this is the last uh, episode of this series. Uh, but next week we'll actually be taking it to the next level, a whole new level, because we're going to be talking about how we occupy politically for the whole month of February. So this is going to be something very exciting. Make sure you're here. Make sure you bring your friends. We want to be prepared for what God is going to do in March in this country through us. And so be here next week. But for today, I want to go to the last F. Uh, we've talked about occupying in our faith, occupying in our family, occupying in our finances, in our fitness. And today we want to talk about occupying in our field or our career. 
this is what we want to talk about today. I'm going to be speaking about Occupy Vocationally. Uh, and what I want to do is ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to this passage that has become very familiar. This is a record-breaking fifth time that I'm preaching from the same text. Uh, Luke chapter 19. We're going to be reading from verse 11 uh, to 27. And to help me do that, uh, Johan gave a sneak, uh, gave us a sneak about that, uh, is actually one of our beloved pastors in this church. Uh, he is actually the pastor from Mavuno, Berlin, and he's here this weekend with us. Uh, the reason he's here is because this week is our, our staff retreat. Once a year, we go as a staff team for a week, and we spend time just uh, engaging in our vision, uh, getting ready spiritually as well as uh, mentally uh, for the things that God is calling us to do in the year. And so we have a contingent from Berlin. We're going to have a contingent from Uganda soon and all the other countries where there are Mavuno pastors. So please put your hands together for Pastor Daniel uh, for all the way from Berlin. Good morning, Mabuno. I bring you warm greetings, or should I say cold greetings, from Berlin. It's winter there. When I left, when I departed there, um, the snow was melting, and um, the week before we had minus 10. Anyway, I bring you warm greetings from Berlin. <laughs> we are doing great there. Mabuno Berlin is growing, and I'm, 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 I'm excited about what God is doing there. Just last Sunday, we had a meeting in our house welcoming our first-time visitors. And we got the chance to pour out all the Kenyan hospitality that we kind of encapsulated during our three years here. So you had tea, we had all the things that you do for visitors. And just we welcomed them at church and also at our home to make a personal relationship with them. And we are excited. We are growing. Um, currently, the church is uh, turning to an average church in Germany. An average church in Germany is 70 people. We left that behind us. We are now turning 70 to 90 people on a Sunday. So I'm excited about that. I'm very thankful for all your prayers. I'm thankful for the executive team, for the leading pastors here, for giving us support, for helping us, for counseling us, for encouraging us. This is what you need when you're out in the harvest field. The harvest is plentiful there. Berlin is a city of Nairobi in terms of population. We are 3.5 million. But there are so few churches, so there are many chances for meeting people who are not going to church on a given Sunday. I see traffic here on a Sunday. In Germany and Berlin, roads are empty on a Sunday. There's nothing going on. Nobody's going to church. So the harvest is plentiful. Pray with, uh, pray with us for, la for the laborers. Now let's read the scripture. That's why I'm here. <laughs> now, as they were listening to these things... I learned from Kenyans. If you have the stage, you take it. Now, as they were listening to these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was approaching Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God was going to be brought to light and shown forth immediately. He therefore said, a certain nobleman went into a distant country to obtain for himself a kingdom and then to return. Calling ten of his own bond servants, he gave them ten minas, each equal to about a hundred days' wages or nearly twenty dollars, and said to them, Buy and sell with these while I go and then return. But his citizens detested him and sent an embassy after him to say, We do not want this man to become ruler over us. When he returned after having received the kingdom, he ordered these bond servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much each of one had made by buying and selling. The first one came before him and he said, Lord, your mina has made me ten additional minas. And he said to him, well done, excellent bond servant. Because you have been faithful and trustworthy in a very little thing, you shall have authority over ten minas, over ten cities. The second one also came and said, Lord, your mina has made five more minas. And he said also to him, And you will take charge over five cities. Then another came and said, Lord, here is your mina, which I have kept laid up in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you are a stern, that means hard or severe man. You pick, up, you pick up what you did not lay down and you reap what you did not sow. He said to the servant, I will judge and condemn you out of your own mouth, you wicked slave. You knew, did you, that I was a stern man, picking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow. Then why did you not put my money in the bank? so that on my return I might have collected it with interest. And he said to the bystanders, 
Take the mina away from him and gift it to him who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas already. And said Jesus, I tell you that to everyone who gets and, will, uh, gets and has will more be given. But from the man who does not get and does not have, even what he has will be taken away. The indignant king ended by saying, But as for these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them in my presence. Thank you, Pastor Daniel. Our Father, we just want to come before you now as we have read your word and heard it spoken over us. And Lord, we want to declare that we are your servants, we are your children, we are here to hear your word. We're not here to be entertained, but we're here to be transformed. And so we invite you now to come and allow your work of transformation to begin in each of our hearts. I pray that, Lord, that you would find a fertile soil here for the seed of your word to germinate and to bring productive fruit. Lord, we resist any work of the evil one. We come against any spirit that would keep your people from hearing your word today. We cast it out of this place. And Lord, we take authority over the airwaves here. And we declare that only your purpose, only your will, only your thoughts shall be established in this place. So Father, now come and speak to us. We are your servants and we are listening. For we pray this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And God's people say it. Amen. Now traditionally, many Christians have had a, a, a mistaken belief that the spiritual aspect of life is more important to God than the physical or the secular so-called aspect of life. And therefore, that those who are working in the secular marketplace are of less important than those who are working in Christian ministry, what we call full-time ministry. That those people in the marketplace sort of play a secondary role of supporting uh, those who, people like myself, who are preaching the gospel. And your job is to give money so that I can spread the gospel. This is kind of what the traditional mistaken view has been. So the people on the front line, what we call full-time ministry, are the ones really important. The secular world is seen as an evil place. And the church is where people come on the weekend to clean up after being contaminated in that, uh, in that uh, a dirty place, contaminated place, and then go back spiritually clean and ready to face the week. Now, this is very similar to the Jews, the view of the Jews in Jesus' time. That many of them actually believed that they should focus on their religion and separate themselves from the evil world. Not realizing that God had actually placed them there for the sake of the place that they were living in. This is why Jesus told this story. You see, your work matters to God. God is interested, not just in your worship and what you do here on a Sunday, but he's interested in your whole life. You know, if you ask many Christians, how are you doing spiritually? Chances are they'll assess how they're doing in their Bible reading, in their prayer, in their giving, in their fellowship. That's how they'll use it to assess it. Not understanding God also is interested in how you're doing spiritually in your workplace. That God is interested in your job as a banker or as a sales rep or as a teacher or as a student. Whatever it is, the place where he has put you. If you read the Bible, you will find that God used very many people who are not in so-called full-time ministry. Abraham and Isaac were ranchers. Nehemiah and Daniel were government officials. Joshua and Samson were professional soldiers. David was a musician who became a king. Solomon was a king who became a poet. Esther was a beauty queen. What? God uses even beauty queens. Saul was an academic. Priscilla and Aquila were manufacturers. Luke was a medical doctor. All these were ordinary people in their professions, serving God in that place. And God used them to fulfill his kingdom purpose in their generation because they were faithful. What am I saying today? I'm saying that my job is God's assignment. Not my job, Pastor M. Your job. <laughs> what you do Monday to Saturday, that is God's assignment. My job is God's assignment. When we began Mavuno Church seven years ago, one of the things that really troubled me was this sharp divide that Christians often put between what is so-called Christian, the Christian world, and the secular world. It's almost as if they believed God is the God of the spiritual Christian world and not the God of the secular world as well. Well, I want to give you news today. My God is God over all the earth. He's not just God over Mavuno. He's God over Microsoft. 
He's God of a safaricom. He's God over any single place where you have your place of work today. You see, I was so bothered by how many Christians displayed excellence when it came to their prayer, when it came to reading the word, when it came to even going on missions. But when you examined it, you found that few Christians were known for that excellence in the workplace. And even when they were, it wasn't because of their faith. It was because of something else. And so we began to ask this question. How do we disciple people who find faith irrelevant? Because many of my generation found faith irrelevant. How do we help such people not just discover who God is, but begin to understand their calling to change and impact the world that God put them in? And in response to this question, I believe that God led us to the Mavuno Marathon. This is what this church is all about. You hear us talk about it and different aspects of it often. Well, he, you hear us tell, t talk, to, t talk to you about coming to church often, that you can be in inspired and receive God's word and impact the world. You hear us talk about doing Mizizi, a 10-week experience that helps you connect with God, with your purpose, with people going towards your purpose. You hear us talk about joining a life group because we always say at Mavuno Church, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. And so the life group is a place you connect with people who will help you go far. We talk about the fact that once you're in a life group, you need to take Simama and to take Ombi and to take Hatua. These are experiences designed to help you to occupy. This is what Mavuno Church exists for. We exist not to help you get busy. You know, some people would think that maybe this church just wants to keep me busy in church doing classes. That's not our purpose. Our purpose is to help you be effective in occupying your industry in occupying every sector of society where God has planted you. Because you see, my job is God's assignment. Not everybody got this, however. And over the years, different people have left Mavuno Church because they felt, you know, I've arrived. I've sort of done this. I've, I've done the class. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for another different experience now. Been there, bought, uh, what do they say? Been there, done that. Bought the Mavuno t-shirt. I've got it now. I understand this thing. Let me go and look for deeper spiritual existence. But you know what is happening? People miss the point as they did that. They miss the point that Mavuno is not about you going through a class. Mavuno is about the result of what happens as you do that experience. Romans chapter 8 verse 19. I've shared this verse many times. That the creation groans in eager expectation for the sons and the daughters of God to be revealed. This is what Mavuno church is. And the minute you begin to see generous wealth creators, humble public servants, passionate health practitioners, compassionate counselors, practical educators, bold media personalities, radical church planters, going out into society, extending God's kingdom wherever he placed them, then you will know that Mavuno has been effective. Look at your neighbor. Do they look like a complete product yet? Tell them, I put it to you, you're still a work in progress. There's still work that is going on. And we need to understand why we're doing what we're doing. It's that society can be changed. My job is God's assignment. You see, the ten servants in this passage were each given the same amount of money. And they were given an instruction that was very interesting. They were told, occupy till I come. Invest this until I return. What you need to understand is that the job they were being given was not an easy task. It was a subversive task. They were being assigned to trade with people. <laughs> Think about it. The very people, the Bible tells us, the people that they were trading with did not want their master to be king. Did you get that as he was reading it? We've read this five times. Surely you've got that. The people they were trading with did not want their master to be king. And so every time they were trading with somebody, every profit they were making would make it easier for their master to be king. So the people who were trading with them, the work they were doing was actually subversive to them. It was upsetting the order of things. It was actually overthrowing the way things were. They had to be very subtle as they did it. They had to be smart as they did it. But you know, the Bible tells us that you must be shrewd as serpents, innocent as doves. They had to go in there knowing that as they worked, they were working for the overthrow of things the way they were and bringing about the kingship of their master over those they were trading with. You know, many of you work in environments that are hostile to God's order. Your work environment is hostile to God's purposes. Many of you work in places that are characterized by corruption, or strife, or envy, or injustice, or office politics, and backbiting, or indifference. And I find many times that even those who work in Christian organizations, 
that they find themselves often surprised. They tell me, Pastor M, I got a job in this Christian NGO, and I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you are in such a shock. Because, of course, they're thinking, oh, I'm just going to a place now where people just wake up praising God and thanking God the whole day, and we just serve God and we love each other in sweet Christian fellowship. Not like the place I came from. And then they go there and they find the exact same problems. Why? Because you can take the world <laughs> out of the person. You can take the person out of the world, but you can't take the world out of the person that easily just by relocating them physically. And so they find even there, there's strife. There's office politics. People are backbiting. Oh, but it's a Christian place. Yes, but the people have issues. Yes, they do. And one of the things you need to realize is that your purpose, where you are, to is to occupy. And that means to undermine the order of things that you find there. Your job is not to compromise with the order of things as you find them. It's to overthrow them or to set the ground for God to overthrow them. To institute the new order of God's kingdom in the marketplace. What am I saying? Occupy in your workplace. Occupy in your workplace. Occupy wherever God has planted you. In this time and in this season that he has placed you there. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. How did you end up doing what you do for a living? Yeah, how, how? How did you end up? This is not a rhetorical question. <laughs> I, actually, I actually want you to tell me. How did you end up doing what you do for a living? How did you end up doing what you do? I mean, how did you find yourself working in that office or in that course of study that you're taking right now? How did that happen? How did it happen? Anybody here would say, it's an opportunity that came through for me. I mean, I sent many CVs. This is the one I found. <laughs> Let me just see. Show of hands. Let's be open right now. Show of hands. Yeah, this is the opportunity that I found. <laughs> How many people would say, I had the money was good? I mean, Pasi, I mean, for real? I mean, I went to this career because I was told money was good in this field. Anyway, just show, show of hands. It's okay. Don't, don't be shy. It's okay. I mean, that's not why you're there now, but this is why you entered in the first place, isn't it? Yeah? <laughs> How many people say, I ended up where I am because of my parents? Uh, show of hands, you know, your parents picked the course of study or your dad nudged you and let you know that this is what he was willing to pay for. Let me just say show of hands. There's quite a few people. By the way, somebody on Facebook this week said, the reason I'm doing what I'm doing is because my parents, I told them I wanted to do broadcasting. And they didn't know what that was. So they went to a comp college and they saw ICT. And they said, that sounds complex. It must be broadcasting. So they signed me for broadcasting. I didn't even know what ICT myself was. And so she studied and she says, now I'm a computer technician and I love it. But I had no idea it was by mistake. My parents picked it. How many people landed where you are by mistake? Yeah, quite a few people as well. By the way, are guys shy in Mavuno Church today? C guys are feeling, they're looking shy. They don't look like they're telling the truth here. How many people, you did an internship, you're not even intending to be there, but somehow you're still there many years later. Let me just say, show of hands. Yes, quite a few people are in that place. In fact, some of the pastors in this church are in that, in that exact same place. I, so let them not fool you. You know, there are many, many reasons why we're in that place. But how many people would say, in fact, even where I am is not where I'm supposed to be. I'm marking time waiting for the big break. Come on, show of hands. Lord, I'm trusting you. This is not my final destination. <laughs> I have a place that I'm going to. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the amazing thing about our story is that many people were in a work environment that was hostile to God. And yet the interesting thing is God still held them accountable in that hostile place in that place where they thought, where am I here? To still glorify him. To still influence, uh, still influence uh, where we are. You know, I'll never forget in Zambia, when we went to, the first time we went to Zambia, we were going to start a Mizizi class as a preparation uh, to, to start Mavuno Church, Lusaka. And so in Zambia, we went there and we were having a great time. And then we met this guy. And this guy worked for the, the largest national brewery. Uh, he was... Uh, serious corporate leader. Uh, he was top, I think, top two or top three in that uh, farm. That's one of the largest farms in Zambia. And he, he um, was very eloquent. The one thing I discovered after him that is that he was an elder at his church. And so for me, I was like, okay, uh, breweries, elder. Something, <laughs> Swiss make, you know, it wasn't working. Huh? There, was, there was something not quite driving there. Uh, and I wanted to ask him, I mean, how, how is this working? I mean, you're, you're, you're in charge of <laughs> intoxicating the nation. I mean, <laughs> with a spirit that is not the spirit of God. I mean, what's the plan? 
But, but you know what he told me? He, he, actually, he didn't tell me. I, before I asked him, I had him preach at the church. I went to church. I didn't even know he would be preaching that weekend. And he was the one actually preaching. And he said, let me share with you my testimony. Because some of you wonder why I work where I, I work. He says, God actually planted me there. I am God's plant in the largest brewery in this country. And he said, you know what? Because of me, there are no billboards near any schools, high schools, primary schools, or colleges in this country. It is illegal. He said, I petitioned for that. He said, because of me, you will never find sachets sold nationally, uh, alcohol in small sachets. That is a, 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 a something that in, uh, impoverishes, the po it makes people poorer. And he said, because of me and because of my influence, you will never find that in this country. And he said, you know what? If not me, who? If I, didn't ha if I was not in that position, the person who would be in it would be destroying this nation. God planted me to be in this place. There is a man who was occupying. There is a man who was occupying. Wow! I, mean, I was so intrigued. I thought, my goodness, this guy is subtle. I mean, he's, he's winning awards in the corporate. People love him. He does such a good job for them. They don't understand. He's actually there to undermine the order of things. Under his watch, that country will not become a country of, drug, drug, uh, uh, of drunkards in the name of Jesus. This is what he exists for. Ask your neighbor, why do you exist? Why are you in the place that God put you? What's the bigger reason? Apart from just earning a paycheck. You see, my job... My job, Mavuno, my job is God's assignment. My job is God's assignment. This is why God put me there. You see, a gospel that is primarily about spiritual things, it cannot lead us to change the world or to occupy. It's useless for that. It's an incomplete gospel. What does it mean to run a business with integrity? In a world where corruption in that industry is strife, is rife. What does it mean to pay your employees fairly when none of your competitors is doing the same? And thus they're making more profits because they're, 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 they're oppressing the people who work for them. What does it mean to tithe your company profits when nobody else in your industry is thinking that and you're, you're actually losing your competitive edge by tithing when everybody else is reinvesting instead? What does it mean to turn down lucrative contracts or job offers or proposals Simply because you say, this is not jiving with my faith. This is not going to lead to an increase in God's kingdom. When nobody else in your industry is thinking the same. What does it mean to be a blessing to your colleagues? When that place you work, everybody just gossips and backbites. And people are wondering, why are you even being so nice? There must be something you want. How do you represent God's kingdom in a toxic place like that? You see, I want to put it to you. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where... True Christianity is shown. Or don't you know that it's quite easy to be very Christian. Once a week, two hours, dressed in my Sunday best at Mavuno Church. Is it easy to be a Christian at that point? Oh yes, I can see you. You look so Christian right now. Look at your neighbor. How Christian do they look? I mean, they look so saved. Even the angels are blushing. I mean, they look so nice. This is how they look. But it's for two hours. Let me tell you, it's almost like holding your breath. You can do this for two hours. It's very easy. But I want to tell you that week to week, Saturday, Monday to Saturday, hour after hour, when you're pressed to the wall, when things are not working out, that's where you truly show what a Christian is. That's where people are able to say, my goodness, that's a real Christian. Because my job is God's assignment. My job is God's assignment. I remember once being very proud. Uh, I felt so proud that day when a uh, person from this church came and shared with me. Her name is Sandra. Sandra, uh, she was called Owiti, now she's called Chege. Sandra came and shared with me a story. She said, Pastor M, you won't believe what happened. And I said, what happened? She says, I was out training. And she's a trainer. She does training uh, with her husband. They do corporate training. And they were training a, a, a company there. And uh, in the middle of the training, this lady just walks up to her, comes up to Sandra, and uh, I think they were having a break. And the lady says, I have a question. I hope you won't be offended. And she says, no, ask me. And she says, are you from Mavuno Church? So Sandra's like, uh, okay, <laughs> is it how I'm dressed? What, <laughs> what's, what, what? She says, well, why do you ask? And the lady said, you know, I've had a few encounters with people from Mavuno. Joyful, purposeful, and just, they just seem to be overflowing with something. And she said, you reminded me so much of them. Are you from Avuno Church? And this time, Sandra, because she knew she wasn't being, being accused of anything, she said, yes! I, I, 
hear from Mabuno Church. And when she shared that story for me, with me, I was so excited. I said, oh my God, it's happening. It's happening. It's happening. That people are being known, not for what they do on Sunday, but for what they do on the week-to-week basis, day-to-day basis, out in the marketplace. God is being glorified. This is what it means to occupy. When people begin to say there's something unique, there's something different, what is it about you that is so attractive? My job is God's assignment. I believe that God is calling the church of our generation not just to tolerate the secular world, but to infiltrate it and to, do, uh, to domesticate it and to bring the influence of God's kingdom there. You know, we will never see a true turnaround of this continent unless God's people step out into every sector of society as God's agent in the world. It's very interesting that when we talk about our jobs, we use the same word that we're using this month when we're talking about, what's your job called? It's your occupation, isn't it? We're talking about occupy. What are we saying? We're saying the, occupy your occupation. Get into that place. The word is there. The job is there. It needs somebody to step up and to occupy. And many places are struggling and, and suffering right now. Many of our workplaces are not showing God's influence because God's people have not stepped in and are not occupying. Occupy. Tell your neighbor, occupy your occupation. Because my job is God's assignment. What would happen if you really be- believed that God was your true boss? You know that boss of yours? That's not who employed you. He's not the one or she's not the one who gave you that job and he's not the one and she's not the one who's going to fire you from that job. You will leave when God says you leave. Anybody know that? Oh yeah, it doesn't matter how tyrannical and how, how bad-mooded they are. It's not your boss who hired you. God, the God of heavens, hired you. And he's the one who says when it's over and moves you to the next place. And how, how, if you really believe that, how would your mindset change about that office? I suspect for some of you, you know what? Your quiet time, your time in the Word, would not be a dry place where you're just trying to meet the, the obligation. This is my daily reading. You'd be getting your briefing for that day. You'd be understanding, what must I do today, Lord, to glorify you in that workplace? I suspect for some of you, that you'd be praying over every contract, every proposal, every assignment that leaves your desk. You'd be saying, God, be glorified by this. And you'd be always looking for opportunities to glorify God. I suspect some of you would be praying much more for your office. Can I make a confession? Uh, as pastors, I, some of you have heard me say this before, we pray over the chairs in this church. We pray, literally, over the, the prayer you're sitting on has been prayed over by a pastor. And the prayers we pray are not nice prayers. We say, Lord, let this, fire, let, let this chair have fire. Let that person who is sitting be so burnt up by your word, they'll never be mediocre again in Jesus' name. This is how we pray for you. We pray, Lord, may they come in this place confused. May they live with clear mind. May they come in this place with their own ideas. May those ideas be shattered. And Jesus' ideas be what they live with from this place. This is how we pray for you. Because we want to overturn the order of your life. I pray because I'm the pastor of this church. And that's how I pray for those chairs. You know, if you know that God has called you to that office and that is your assignment, you will be coming early and you'll be praying over those chairs. You'll be praying over that tyrannical boss of yours, saying, God, the power of God, the fruit of the Spirit is in this man. Love, joy, peace, and self-control. This is what I'm praying for this man. You'll be coming over your colleagues and saying, Lord, strife is over in this office in the name of Jesus because God's servant works in this office. This is how you'd be praying and you'd be waking up early because you'd know that you are the pastor for that office. Pastor. (laughs) No, stop looking at your neighbor. I'm talking about you. (laughs) Yes, that's who God calls you. You are the pastor. Kings and priests. That's what God calls you. He has ordained you for that place. To bring about his influence and his change in that place. And I suspect that many of you would prioritize the training tool in this church we call the marathon. Not as something to do to fill the time, but as something to equip you to take over. Because you would know you need to be equipped to take over that marketplace. In verse 17, the master said, words that we hope to all hear from our master one day, said, well done, excellent servant. Well done, excellent servant. Because you have been faithful and trustworthy in a very little thing, you shall have authority over ten cities. I love that verse. What it's telling me is that all along, the master had a plan. When he was designing this assignment, when he was giving the minas, when he was giving these pounds to his servants, that it wasn't about the pounds. It was about what he saw them as, what he saw them doing. 
You see, he considered them not just as servants, which is what they thought of themselves, but he saw them as governors in waiting. He knew he needed governors. He knew his new government would need people to run the place. Who better than the people who worked for him? And so he gave them this tool, this mina, to train them for the assignment that he had for them. You see, ultimately, our responsibility on earth, our purpose on earth, it's, <laughs> no matter how meaningful it is, it's merely a shadow of the greater responsibility that God has for you one day. This is what the Bible tells us. You see, when God looks at you, he doesn't see you as you see yourself. He doesn't see you even as people around you sees you. God sees a governor in waiting. This is what God sees when he looks at you. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 22 verse 5, it talks about the, king, the, the, the city that is prepared for us when our Savior comes. It tells us about the fact that there actually is a place that God has dominion over and that earth is a rehearsal for this place. And then it tells us in this place there will be no more tears. There will be no more strife. There will be no more challenge because God himself, his light will be in that city. And then the best part of it, it says, and they shall reign forever and ever. Oh, I love that verse. Do you, you know that old song, um, Handel's Messiah? How many of you know that? You've been in church long enough that you know that one. Huh? And he shall reign forever and ever. Some of you are too young to remember that. You know, the amazing thing is, I used to think that the Bible talks about Jesus being the one who reigns forever and ever. I never knew that it was more than that. When you read this passage, it says, who? They. They shall reign forever and ever. It's saying that when God designed you, he was looking for governors to govern the planets, to govern the worlds. If you read the book of Hebrews chapter 1 and 2, you realize I'm not making this up. It says that even the angels are, are ministering spirits. It says that one day your PA will be codenamed, uh, codenamed Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel, come, take notes. And he'll be moving his iPad and taking the notes as you're saying, we need to change that world like this. This is what your destiny is. I remember C.S. Lewis once wrote, and he said that if you saw the person next to you, as God sees them, you would be tempted to fall down and worship. Because God sees a glorified being here waiting to be unleashed. Look at your neighbor right now. Tell them you may not look like much. But God has big plans for you. <laughs> and this is what God wants for us. That we will be prepared to reign forever and ever. And your current work assignment is simply preparation for much greater things that are yet to come. You see, it's time to remember who you are. You're a daughter or a son of the living king. That place where you are, whether you put yourself there or not, whether you went into it willingly or not, whether it's a place you're going to be for the rest of your life or not, it is God's assignment for you. And God wants you to thrive there. You know, I remember I, when, uh, since we began Mavuno, we've always talked about your purpose. Find your purpose. Discover what God has called you to. And many times I find that people get confused with this whole purpose discussion. I meet people saying, Pastor M, how do I know that I'm in my purpose right now? How do I know that I'm not missing it? Should I quit my job? What, what, what is it to, to enter my purpose? I find people confused. But I sense what the, this passage is telling us, and I think one of the best things of the pieces of news in this passage, is that God rewards his people on the basis of faithfulness with what they have now. God isn't going to reward you with what he hasn't given you yet. He's going to reward you on the basis of what he's given you now. That work assignment, that place he's put you in, what is his purpose for you there? Some of you are unemployed right now, and you're thinking, this someone doesn't work for me. I'm waiting for the day I get a job. No, right where you are. God has put you there for a reason. Maybe instead of saying, when I get a job, I'll start being productive. Maybe you should be asking, where can I volunteer right now? Where can I serve others right now? Where can I be of maximum value? And you know what? Even though this may not be the place where God wants you forever, even though this may just be a temporary place for you, serve in such a way that one day people will say, you know what? There used to be a real Christian in that position. They'll say, you know what? I'd never met, I'd heard about Christians. I didn't think much about them until one day and say, now I know what a true Christian looks like because this person came into my life. Serve in such a way 
that God will be fully glorified in the position you are in now. And I'm not just talking about people who are in uh, the so-called secular workplace. Some of you work for Christian NGOs. You need to show God's light and be so different that people will say, now we know what a true Christian looks like. Remember, my job... Oh, come on. Somebody needs to wake up in Mavuno Church today. My job is God's assignment. My job is God's assignment. I want to conclude. I'm going to go on record with the shortest sermon Pastor Emma has ever preached. I want to conclude. And I want to share a story, as I do, of a really good uh, couple of friends of mine. Uh, these friends were... Some, <laughs> I really looked up to them. Pretty much more than I'd looked up to anybody uh, t t until that stage of my young life. I was a young believer. I joined this church called Nairobi Chapel. And there was this couple. They led the worship team. Uh, they were some of the finest human beings I've ever met. I mean, the guy was a gifted, gifted pianist. Uh, his wife was just a leader. And they had, uh, they, had, <laughs> they had God's spirit on them. You know, people who you just, feel, you meet them and you're like, these are real people. Uh, they were not pretending. They just embraced us as young students. And we loved them. I mean, loved them, loved them to bits. And uh, uh, through the course of their studies, at one, I mean, of their work, at one point we were sad because they had to go to Canada uh, to study for four years. Uh, they went and did a degree there. And so we had to say goodbye to them. But we knew it was only for a short while. And they went. And actually, their leaving actually helped me step up because I became a worship leader after he left. Uh, some of us had to step up into that uh, position. But anyway, he left and his wife, and they went, and they did well in Canada. We'd hear good reports once in a while. And then they finished their studies, and now they had to just do the practicum, the few months of practical work experience before they came back. The anticipation was rising. Everybody in the church was excited about them coming back. And then, surprisingly to all of us, they had an accident on the highway, and they crashed, and they died. No survivors. I remember asking God, why would you do that? This doesn't make sense. I mean, <laughs> why would you take the best of us? I mean, there are people in the church you could have taken. <laughs> that, that could, <laughs> there are people you could have taken. But you know, we cried. And I remember just, there was not a single dry eye. We were such a small church that the whole of Nairobi Chapel was much smaller than the people who are sitting in this audience right now. We, we knew everybody and we knew each other well. And so there were tears and there was just a lot of devastation. Some of us were really shaken in our faith. And I remember asking God, Lord, why would you allow them to be trained, to be equipped, to be so prepared, only to just <laughs> kill them? What is that about? And I didn't get it until the day of the funeral. And the amazing thing that happened at the funeral is the place was parked, Nairobi Chapel was parked. But in addition to the people there, the Kenyans who were there, there was a group of Canadians who came for the funeral as well. And what I discovered at the funeral is actually they paid for all the expenses, uh, funeral expenses on that end uh, from Canada, uh, just with gifts, because the couple had been an incredibly uh, productive couple while they were there. They had led people to Christ. People in their college had been changed permanently. They had served in a church and had such fruitful impact in that church. That church was shaken. I mean, these guys were so part of the church. They changed their, their Kenyan hospitality, their big heart just changed the whole church. People loved them. They became such a center of their community. And when they died, you know, it became so clear to me at the funeral as we had testimony after testimony of how people had been changed, of how this whole community owned them. In fact, the one saying they were your people, they were saying these are our people as well. I began to realize all the time I had thought God was preparing them for their purpose when they came back. But God from the beginning of time had ordained that every step of their preparation would be for those four years in Canada. That was their life purpose. And when they concluded it, God was ready for them and he promoted them to a higher place. Oh my goodness, I was struck that day to realize that many of us we think where we are is a temporary space. We think, you know what, I can't do anything here. I'm so frustrated here that you don't understand that where you've been right now is God's assignment. And you don't have any control about what comes in the future, but you have what control over what happens today. That you can begin to influence that workplace today. You can begin to influence that children's home. You can begin to influence that NGO. You can begin to influence that bank in such powerful ways. That when your time comes, everybody will say, this person, finish the task that God assigned them to earth for. And this is my prayer for us as we conclude, Mavuno. God is calling us to occupy. 
And occupying begins right there where you are. My job. Tell your neighbor, my job is God's assignment. Amen. Now, as <laughs> before we pray, I'm going to pray for us. And did you get a little something, something, and you wondered what it was for? Yeah, you, you just hold up your coin. I hope you didn't put it in the offering. It wasn't for you to <laughs> give back to us. There was a purpose for this. I wanted to give us the equivalent of Amina, but Amina is three months' salary, and some of you aren't too much, so uh, <laughs> we couldn't do that. So what we did instead is we got a Kenyan shilling. It's not a big amount of money. The whole idea of this is that it works as a reminder. This is our Amina moment. This is your Amina as you enter into this year. Now, for some of us, I suspect that before you reach home, you'll have lost it. You'll even have forgotten what we talked about this whole month. I suspect there are others here who will keep it very safely somewhere so it will never get lost. And at the end of the year, you'll even have forgotten. It will, it will be so safe until I remind you at the end of the year and you'll be like, oh my gosh, yes, there was something. And you'll return it and say it was wrapped up very carefully. And here is your mina. But I suspect that there are some of you who having received this, that you'll put it up somewhere prominent. You paste it somewhere. By the way, it's such a nice amount because it won't be stolen by very many people. You, this is why we thought it was a good idea. You paste it on a mirror. You paste it on your desk. You paste it on your computer. You put it somewhere. And every day when you look at this, you remember, I am here to occupy. And I'm here to occupy until my master says, done. And that your work will become a place of assignment. And I want to also say that I believe that some people will come at the end of this year. Many people, I hope, will come at the end of this year when we have our testimony weekend. And many people will still be holding their mina when they come. And they'll be saying, I can't wait to tell you how my office has changed because I've occupied. And there's some of you who will be saying, I can't wait to tell you how my finances have changed since I chose to occupy. There's some millionaires who will be jumping up and down, saying, I'm a kingdom giver right now. I was in debt, but my life has changed. There's some of you who will be saying, I can't wait to tell you how my family has been transformed because I've occupied. And there's some of you who will be standing up. We won't even need to hear what your occupation testimony is. Your body will be growing with good health. And you'll stand up and people say, okay, sit down. We know where you've occupied. The muscles tell us. The tonedness, the fitness tells us that you're occupying physically as well. And there's some of you who will be telling, you, telling us, you know, I didn't even know God well. But this year I've come to be so intimate with him because I've occupied spiritually. This is my charge to you. The choice is yours. The choice is yours. Come on, let's give glory to God right now. Bless you, Jesus. I want to pray for us as we conclude. Father, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for this wonderful family that you call Mavuna Church. I thank you that, Lord, you are such a good God. And that, Lord, you have such good plans for us. I thank you that this is a year Mavuna occupies. We occupy by owning our own land and moving on to it. But much more significantly, Lord, we occupy as a congregation in every sphere that you have planted us for, that you created us for. We are going to occupy this year. Father, I pray for faithfulness among the people in this audience. I pray that, Lord, you would cause us to be people who truly represent you in our workplace. Because of this congregation, Lord, there are going to be testimonies coming out, even among our non-Christian workmates, that now I know what a Christian looks like. People who keep their word. People who are serious about their calling. People of excellence. People who love even in places where it's difficult to love. That Lord, there will be a difference and a significance in this congregation. And as usual, before we conclude, I want to give us a moment of confession. I suspect that there are some people who are here who understand for the first time. This time, now I understand it. Because I know that if I was to be called, if the master was to return today, I'd be one of those servants who has not accepted his leadership. I've not accepted his leadership in my life. I've been leading myself. But there's somebody who's in this house who's beginning to now finally understand. This is why I must give my life to Jesus. This is why I must do this. Because I cannot lead myself. I cannot lead myself. There's somebody who's understood. You know when I give my life to Jesus, I'm not, I'm not, giving, I'm not doing God a favor. He doesn't need my life. I'm doing me a big favor. Because I'm putting my life under the leadership of the only one who can lead me to my purpose. The only one who can help me occupy. 
And so if you're here, we want to just pray with you. I'm going to ask you, if you, you want to say, Pastor, I am just pray for me. Because I'd like to give my life to God today. I want to actually come under his occupation. That I can occupy in my family. Occupy in my finances. As he ordained me to. If you're here, I'm going to ask you to just raise your hand wherever you are. We're going to celebrate you and then just pray for you real quick. Just raise it up and then put it down. Anybody who is here. Any brothers or sisters saying pray for me. I see a sister right in the middle here. To God be the glory. Just raise it up. I see another brother. Well... To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Anybody else who's saying today is my day. I'm going to break free. No longer walking in bondage. No longer walking in the bondage of self-leadership. But I'm going to walk in the, in the leadership of the one who called me to be an occupier. Anybody else? Just raise your hand. Join those two who've raised their hands. If you're outside as well, I can see you. Just raise it wherever you are. To God be the glory. Just raise it wherever you are. We're going to give glory to God for you and celebrate you. Come on, let's celebrate those whose hands have been raised so far. There's a brother as well on this side as well. Come on, let's give glory to God for him. Oh, come on, Mavuno, we can do better than that. The angels celebrate when brothers and sisters come into the family. Anybody else who's saying, you know, I want to join this family. I want to be one of those who occupy this year. Don't be left behind. Don't be left behind. God has great purposes and plans for you. He's not coming to take away your joy. He's coming to give you real joy. To show you why he made you. This is the only way you'll ever discover it. Anybody else, just raise your hand real high got a few seconds left. I just want to make sure I cover that person who's been hesitant that this is your day. Come on, don't. If the devil says tomorrow, tell him tomorrow I have no charge of. I only have charge of today. I'm only responsible for today. There's a sister whose hand is up there as well who's saying today is my day. Come on, let's appreciate her as well. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Oh God, we bless your name. We worship you. We give you all the glory. We give you all the glory. We want to pray for those. Let's give glory to God. We give you all the glory we worship you our lord you are worthy to lord we're giving you glory for every single person who's accepted you today we give you all the glory we worship you our lord you are worthy to be you know, here's the thing. This is why we give God glory to God. We recognize it's so hard for a person to give their lives to Jesus unless God himself reveals himself. And so today, if you've raised your hand, you need to understand you've not called yourself. God says you didn't call yourself. I called you. And I appointed you to bear fruit, much fruit. And so we want to just prophesy over you that you will bear fruit even as you accept Jesus. You will be a productive person. God is going to bless you and help you to do that. I'm going to ask you right now, if you raised your hand, we want to pray for you. I'm going to ask you, if you've not yet received a slip of paper from one of our ushers, that you make sure you receive one of those. What we do is we just receive your email and we make sure that we send you some information to connect with you and help you grow. But I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer after me and the rest of the Mavuno family will join them as we pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, come on, say it aloud. Dear Jesus, I come to you. I give you my life. From this day forward, I belong to you. Be my leader. Help me to be fruitful. I renounce my past and all the things that have displeased you in my life. And from this day forward, with your help, I will occupy. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, let's give glory to God. Woo! Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. I want to pray for the rest of us. And God showed me distinctly that there are some people here who have been like David. Your current work circumstances have nothing to do with anything. You wonder, why am I looking after sheep when people are out fighting the battle? Right now you feel like my workplace is irrelevant. The things I'm doing don't matter. And you've had the sense that what you're doing right now does not matter. I believe that God wants to give you a revelation of himself today. Some people here are like Joseph. God told me that some people here who have been persecuted for doing the right thing. And that God wants you to realize that even though you're persecuted, he will still lift you up. This is what happened to Joseph, isn't it? He was even put in prison. But you can't keep a good man down. You can't keep a good woman down. He says, don't be intimidated by them because I'm the one who appointed you to that position. And then lastly, there's a Daniel here. There's somebody who works in a completely hostile work environment, hostile to your faith. And God is saying, regardless, you will still occupy. If you're here, just stand up right now. If you're in one of those categories, I want to just say a special prayer for you before we conclude. Just stand real quick. Those Daniels and Josephs and Davids in this place. Because I believe that God is going to help you to occupy anyway in that place. Begin to just say, God, help me to occupy. Begin to ask God's help right now, even as you stand. Father God, I thank you for these who are standing right now. I thank you because these are your servants. 
But Lord Jesus, it is because of you that they are established in that place. And Lord, I want to thank you that even in their work, in their situation right now, some of them I know are jobless. They don't have employment right now. But I thank you that even where they are, they will bear fruit in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we pray that this season will soon end. And that Lord, you will establish them. And that Lord, you would give them jobs. Anybody without a job, just raise your hand right now even as I pray for you. Lord, I pray that you would give them jobs. That they would glorify you in that place of unemployment. But Lord, even greater still, prepare them for a great place of employment to come. I pray that Lord, there will be testimonies from this congregation of great jobs that you brought to them. Or great business opportunities. Lord, I pray for those who have been persecuted for righteousness. Persecuted for doing the right thing. And I pray that Lord, you would encourage them and strengthen them. In the knowledge that our God is able. You are the one who appointed them, not their boss. And Lord, they will prosper regardless. Lord, I pray for those who have been Daniels, who are working in such a difficult work environment. I pray that, Lord, you give them the courage to stand up in that place for you. And I pray that because of you, that place will be turned around. I thank you for those, Lord, who are like David, working in a place that seems very insignificant right now. And Lord, I pray that because of them, something amazing is going to happen. That, Lord, you will turn that lemon into lemonade. And something beautiful will come out of this season of their life that they're in. And so, Lord, we want to bless you and to thank you. Come on, let's just join those who are standing right now. Let's just join them as we give glory to God. Lord, we bless your name. We want to conclude. We've concluded by blessing ourselves. Today, we're going to conclude by speaking a word of boldly, of bold declaration over ourselves. It's called the fearless creed. Do we have the fearless creed? Thank you. Put it up there. And let's just say it together. This is our declaration as Mavuno Church. Our declaration of occupation in 2013. Are you ready, Mavuno? Let's go together. I am a fearless influencer. My past is forgiven. My future is secure. My present is not for me, but for the one who set me free. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. No more prayerless living, cheap giving, and selfish dreaming. I am part of the change. I will not hesitate to serve. I will gladly pay the cost, contagiously spreading his love. Playing my role on the dream team, the Mavuno family, until all Africa is changed, every sector of society. I align myself to God's purpose. I will be who he calls me to be. I agree to be shaped and molded through his word and through his family until my will and his will fully agree and I become fully the influencer that I was created to be. I am a fearless Influencer, come on, somebody give glory to God. Lord, we declare this word over ourselves. We are occupiers. Give your neighbor a high five, tell them, occupy. Occupy in 2013. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.